I want to read Psalm 85 uh, in a responsive manner, do a responsive reading, which means I'll read verse 1, and then you all together in unison, regardless of your translation, if you'll read verse 2, I'll read verse 3, and we'll alternate through verse 13. You ready? Amen. Psalm 85, verse 1 says, O Lord, you showed favor to your land. You restored the captivity of Jacob. You forgave... I'm sorry, I'm reading yours. You restored the captivity of Jacob. Would you all read verse 2? You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sins. You withdrew all of your fury. You turned away from your burning anger. Restore us and our Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you remind yourself of the things that the evil people have been doing you? Show us your loving kindness, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what my Lord will say, for he will speak peace with his people to his God and Lord. But let them not turn back to the following. Verse 9 says, Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Truth springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. Let's all read verse 13 together. Righteousness will go before him, and will make his footsteps into a way. Uh, this afternoon, I want to put a tag on the text and call it survival or revival. Amen. Survival Amen. or revival. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Survival or revival. Uh, last week, we talked about how men and women of God are encouraged to flee, to follow, and to fight. Today we begin a new sermon series. We'll be here a couple of weeks dealing with this theme of survival or revival. Several weeks ago, I was planning my preaching calendar, and I had shared with even some of you that the Lord had put it in my heart uh, to deal with this topic of revival. Unbeknownst to me, yesterday in Sugarland there was an event called R4S, and it stood for Revival for the Survival of the United States. I am not really aware of what they were doing. I just saw briefly uh, there was a large gathering promoting and preaching about the importance and the need for revival. But I was encouraged to know that oftentimes when the Lord speaks, he confirms it in the mouth of two or three witnesses. I think it's, we just got through singing about it. I think there are many people that are recognizing we are in a time where we are desperate for a move of God. Amen. Amen. Our salvation is not in who wins the next election. Right. It's not even in a COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. It's not when things get back to normal. Our salvation is in the power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When that's your rock and when that's your foundation, it doesn't even matter what's happening around you. Your, 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 your foundation is stable and secure. Somebody say amen. 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 It seems like these are our two options for the body of Christ today. I think we are given an opportunity, presented with a dilemma, that we can choose survival or revival. Yeah. Many times throughout the Old Testament, God gave his people two options. He gave them two choices. It reminds me of the prophet Elijah, who was proclaiming on Mount Carmel to the people of Israel, choose this day whom you will serve. If Baal is God, serve him. If Jehovah is God, then serve Jehovah. He says, but don't falter between two opinions. Joshua had said many years before, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Even the Lord Jesus Christ says in the Gospels, no man can serve two masters. You have to make a choice. You have to make a choice. One of my favorite authors is Oswald J. Smith. And he wrote a book entitled The Passion for Souls. And in that book, he gives two choices for the body of Christ. He says we have to either evangelize or fossilize. Those are the options for the church. Evangelize or fossilize. 
continue to multiply through evangelization or fade into decay through fossilization. Yeah. I think our choices right now in 2020 are enter into survival mode or enter into revival mode. Yeah. Amen. If you remember last week, we saw that in Egypt, we need to flee. In the wilderness, we need to follow. In the promised land, we need to fight. Another way of saying that, others have noticed, is that in Egypt, it's the land of not enough. In the wilderness, it's the land of just enough. In the promised land, it's the place of more than enough. Or perhaps another way to say that is that in the wilderness, you're just surviving. But in the promised land, you are thriving. And so I think our option is to decide that today we're not content with just surviving COVID-19. I'm not content with just surviving politics. Mm -hmm. I'm not content with just surviving racism. I'm not content with just surviving anxiety and surviving frustration. I'm looking for a church that says, I don't just want to survive. God, we need a revival. We need a move of God. We need a wave of the Spirit of God. We need you to come into your house and show this world that you are, in fact, alive. Amen. It was in Psalm 85 where the people of Israel are facing national calamity. Uh, If you're not careful, you assign this to David as people do mistakenly with many psalms. He wrote only about half of the psalms. This is a psalm written by the sons of Korah. And if you notice, in the context of Psalm 85, they're facing national upheaval. And much like us, they're recognizing we need a move of God and we need revival. So I want to give you an outline. I hope you're taking notes. In verses 1 through 3, the first thing they declare is, Lord, you have saved us. They said, Lord, you saved us before. They said, God, you you have saved us in the past. I hope you didn't close your Bible already. Look at Psalm 85, verse 1. Because six times in verses 1 through 3, it says those two words, you have. Follow along with me. In verse 1, you have shown us favor. You have restored the captivity. You have forgiven our iniquity. You have covered all of our sin. You have withdrawn your fury. You have turned away your burning anger. Is anybody listening to this? There are some things that God has already done. And Israel declared, Lord, you have saved us. My question this afternoon is, what does your you have list look like? If you were to make a list for 2020 and look back everything God has done for us thus far, what are your you you haves? Does anybody have some you haves? I've got plenty. Lord, you have taken care of my family. Lord, you have seen us through this. God, you have continued to put food on my table. Lord, you have put clothes on my back. Lord, you have been a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Lord, you have been the lifter of my head and the shade at my right hand. God, you have been faithful. God, you have kept your word. Lord, you have kept your promises. My question is, what are your you haves? If, if you have any you haves, why don't you praise him today for what God has done already? I know this is a crazy, ridiculous year, but I don't want you to forget what God has done. Has he ever seen you through? Has he ever healed you? Has he ever taken care of your kids? Has he ever watched over your family? Has he ever been with you through thick and thin? Has he ever wiped any tears away from your face? He, he has done a whole lot. In fact, it's the message of the wilderness uh, because the Lord reminds them in the Pentateuch that one of the reasons he allowed them to go through the wilderness, in fact, it's in Deuteronomy 8. We just read it. He says, because I need you to remember how I led you all these years through the wilderness. In fact, I like it better in the King James. It's one of the themes of Deuteronomy 8. He continually says, lest ye forget. Lest ye forget. I came on as a herald this afternoon, and and I I just got three words. Lest ye forget. In fact, it's even more dangerous the longer you've been saved. You've got a tendency to forget everything God has brought you out of. And and I just want to declare today, lest 
Ye forget. Don't, don't forget what God has done. Don't forget how many times he raised you up. Don't, don't forget how many times he blessed you knowing you didn't deserve it. Knowing you deserve judgment. And yet God was good and God was faithful and God blessed you anyway. Let's be forget. Hallelujah. And so watch this in verse 1. He says, Lord, you have, you, you've been favorable to us. You've been gracious to us. Man, I don't know about you, but that's my testimony for this year. How about this? That's my testimony for every year. Lord, you've been good. Lord, you've been gracious. Do y'all know what grace is? Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. Amen. I don't know about you, I'm not holy enough to get all the good things God has given me. I'm not smart enough, I'm not brave enough, I'm, I'm not wise enough, and yet in His grace God continues to open up the windows of heaven and bless the Padron household. I don't know how He does it, I don't know why He does it, but I'm together with the sons of Korah saying, indeed, the Lord has been favorable to me. If that's you, just give God some praise right now. Just lift a hand, wave a hand to Him and say, Lord, I acknowledge you've been gracious to me. You, you've taken care of us. You have looked out for us. Somebody say amen. amen. But now in verses 2 and 3, this, this is the part that gets me excited. Because in theology, there's a term called soteriology. Soteriology is just the study of salvation. And Psalm 85 verses 2 and 3 are rich treasures of soteriological truth. I know I already read it. Can you just listen to the words? You have forgiven our iniquity. Yeah, That's soteriology. Amen. You have covered all of our sin. That's the study of salvation. Thank you, Jesus. you have withdrawn all of your fury. Soteriology. You, you have turned away from your burning anger. That's the study of salvation. Mm. And so in your you have list, friends, don't forget the most important you have. It's not just, Lord, you have blessed me with a house, and Lord, you've given me a new car, and Lord, you have taken care of us. The most important you have is to acknowledge, Lord, you have saved us. Amen. Lord, you have forgiven me of all of my sin. God, you have cleansed me with the blood of Jesus. Lord, you have saved us. Amen. Now notice in verse 2, the second line says, you have covered all of our sin. In soteriology, we call that atonement. Somebody say atonement. Atonement. Uh, atonement means to cover sin. In, in Hebrew, it's the word kapur, or, or this word here is a variation, it's kasa. He, he says, you have covered our sin. Th that's the message of the Old Testament, that the Lord can cover your sin. Well, why does he cover it? Well, Habakkuk 1.3 says, God is so holy, he can't even look at sin. And so if he's going to be in relationship with his people, he has to do something about our sin problem. And what does he do? He covers it through atonement. Praise the Lord. Okay. But if you notice, in the Old Covenant, the sin problem is still prevalent. How many know that if you cover something, it's still there? Yeah. You just can't see it. Yeah. It wasn't until about 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. When on a cruel cross called Calvary, Amen. the Lamb of God made atonement for our sin like no blood of bulls or goats could ever make. No wonder John the Baptist in John 1.29 saw Jesus walking by the Jordan River and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, watch this, who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus didn't cover your sin. He eliminated it. He took it away. He removed your sin. Watch this. Hallelujah. The east is from the west. That's how far he has removed my transgressions. He, he's thrown them into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. Amen. And it doesn't matter how many people remember your sin, as long as God has chosen to forget your sin, that's all that matters. It, it says we've got atonement in verse 2. And in verse 3, it says, watch this, you have withdrawn your fury. In soteriology, we call that propitiation. Propitiation. Come on, will you say that with me? Propitiation. Propitiation means that when God sees the blood, he turns his anger, his wrath, his fury, his indignation away. 
Let me say that again. When God sees the blood, he turns his fury away. Amen. I need you to understand this afternoon that, that our sin invokes God's wrath and God's fury. He loves his people. But he hates sin. He hates sin because sin is what distances us from him. He hates there to be distance between you and him. And so, rightfully so, he has to hate sin. It, his holiness demands it. His righteousness requires it. And so because of sin, he must judge sin. Yeah. And yet, it's interesting that in the Ark of the Covenant, the lid to the Ark of the Covenant is, in Spanish is called el propiciatorio. That lid on the top of the Ark of the Covenant where the two cherubim are, it's called the propitiation. Why? Because again, 2,000 years ago, when God the Father saw the blood of the Lamb of God, His only begotten Son, what happened? His wrath was turned away from you and I. Amen. Amen. Propitiation. Propitiation. It's not interesting. If you're taking notes, you need to write this one down. Romans 3.25. Watch this. Romans 3.25 says Jesus Christ has become your propitiation. Amen. Amen. He's your mercy seat. Amen. The cross became a mercy seat. Amen. He has saved us. Amen. So I need you to understand today that one of the first steps in revival is remembering. Yeah, amen. Yeah. You know, most Christians, when they think of the steps to revival, they'll mention repentance, and yes, it's up there. But oftentimes, before you can even repent, you've got to remember. Amen. amen. You've got to remember what God has done for you. Amen. You've got to look back at where you used to be. Yes. You have to remember. Amen. In fact, in Revelation 2 and 3, there are seven churches that are receiving letters in Revelation 2 and 3. Seven letters to seven churches. Yeah. One of those churches is called the Church of Sardis. And I've never read a commentator that doesn't agree with this title. Every book I've ever glanced at of Revelation 2 and 3 agrees that Revelation 2 describes the Church of Sardis, which is known as the Dead Church. Ooh. It's the Dead Church because there's nothing happening there. It's the dead church because nobody is alive. Nobody's excited about serving God. Nobody's being saved. Nobody's being discipled. They're not planning churches. They're not making a difference in their community. They're just whittling away and dying. Sardis is the dead church. But watch this. One of the first imperatives that that church receives from the Lord, wouldn't you know, the Lord says to them, remember. Amen. Wow. He says, if you're dead, I need to remember something. Remember what you have received. Amen. And I'm not talking to a dead church. I'm not saying that. I, I'm happy at what God is doing in Destiny Fellowship. But, but every now and then as individuals, sometimes we forget what God has given us. And, and I just want to tell you, like the Sardinians received that message. Notice God says, remember what you have received. Amen. Is there anything you have in your life that you got on your own merit and your own accord? No. Is there anything that you have done that had nothing to do with God's hands and God's involvement? I, I don't know about you. Everything I have deserves a hallelujah to him. Hallelujah. Every good thing I've ever done was not because of my merit. It was only because of his grace. I, I'm together with Israel saying, Lord, you have saved us. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on. God deserves a better praise than that. Put your hands together and give him glory. This afternoon, when he's done everything for you. <laughs> Secondly, they, their second declaration is not just, Lord, you have saved us. If you notice, they moved to the interrogative. Now they're asking, Lord, will you save us? And they said, Lord, you have saved us in the past. God, will you save us right now? Amen. Lord, I know you've done it before. I need to know, God, can you do it today? Anybody ever been there? Lord, I know you healed me a while back, but God, I'm sick right now. I need you to heal me today. God, I know you brought my family through it, but God, I need you to save my marriage today. And this is what they're asking. If you notice again, in verses 5 and 6, there's a list of questions. God, will you be angry with us forever? God, will you prolong your anger? 6, Lord, will you not revive us again? They're asking questions. They want to know, God, will you do it again? God, will you save us? Praise the Lord. 
in Psalm 85, verse 4, notice the first request. They're saying, Lord, restore us. Restore us. Can we make it personal? Just right there. You don't, you don't even have to shout it. You just mumble it in your mask. But, but if that's you, can you just say, God, restore me? Restore me, God. Restore me. Restore means to, to bring you back to that former glory. Restore means that, that you might have lost something along the way. You need it to be restored. It's kind of one of my nerdy things lately. I've been watching videos of how paintings are restored. <laughs> I'm, I'm nerdier than y'all think. I, I DVR Jeopardy. So, <laughs> sorry, I ain't scared y'all. I will find Jeopardy with any of you. And uh, I, I've been recording, watching these um, restoration series on how they'll take a portrait that starts to fade and it starts to lose its color and it doesn't have the shine that it used to have. I'm talking about paintings, not y'all. It, 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 it seems like it's lost its value because it's not shining anymore. And so they'll take an expert artist who knows how to bring it through the process of restoration. Yeah. It, it's a detailed, meticulous, painstaking process, and, and it's very, very slow. They're, they'll look at each thread in the painting and make sure it has the right shade and the right tint, and they'll restore the varnish and all of the different paintings. Sometimes they even have to set it in a new casing, and, and they'll do all of this so that at the end you look at the finished product, and, and sometimes it looks even better than it did before. You see, restoration is not just you getting back to where you used to be. When you truly are restored by the Spirit of God, He, he comes, He brings you looking even better than you used to. You, you're wiser than you used to be. Your, your anointing is greater. You, Lord, restore us. Restore us. Come on. It reminds me of that little three chapter book called Joel in your Bible. It, it starts in Joel chapter 1. And, he says, look, Israel, I know times are tough right now because the locusts have devoured so much. It's old school King James. Y'all remember that? What the canker worm has destroyed. and it's, it's talking about locusts. He says what the swarming locust has eaten, the gnawing locust has taken. And he just goes through the destruction. You have to understand, it was an agrarian society. This is a farming community that Israel was in. And locust was one of the worst plagues they could ever experience and undergo. You could take it a step further and realize that in Joel, it's not just the locusts, but the locusts were a prophecy of the Assyrian army that would, in fact, invade Israel in 722 B.C. Y'all with me so far? I hope I'm not boring you. So what happens in the book of Joel is he's letting them know, look, you, you lost a whole lot when the locusts came. You lost a whole lot when you were attacked. But when you get to Joel chapter 2 and verse 25, watch this. He says, I will restore to you everything that the locust has eaten. I will restore to you the years that you lost. I'll, I'll give you back time. Everybody, Anybody ever feel like, man, I lost some time. I, I lost some years. Watch this. God says, I can restore even time to you. I can restore weeks and months and years that you lost. I, I can restore the joy of your salvation. I can restore the excitement you used to have about ministry. I can restore the love for your husband and the love for your wife. I can restore. God is a God who can restore us. Hallelujah. Amen. Restore us. Restore us. And in verse 6, they got another petition. Lord, don't just restore us. Here's what I want to get to. They say, Lord, come on, it's an open book test. Verse 6, Lord, don't just restore us. God, revive us. Revive us. The Hebrew is the word kaya. It means life. That's why revive is a good translation. He's saying, God, we, we need new life. We need a fresh outpouring of your spirit. We need you to breathe on us again. God, revive your people. Amen. That's the prayer of the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk 3, verse 2, O oh Lord, revive us in the midst of the years. Make known in wrath. Remember mercy. God, bring us new life again. Praise God. You know, I, I, I try to use Facebook just for uh, church purposes and reconnecting with friends, but every now and then, man, it'll, it'll hook me with one of those controversial posts, and I just can't help looking at the comment section. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and there was just one in particular a couple of months ago. 
that uh, somebody put in, and it, it, I just knew it was going to just stir things up. And it, it wasn't even local, it was like a national thing, and, and people from all over, I mean, just hundreds and hundreds of comments and going back and forth, and atheists dividing and debating with believers, and believers debating with unbelievers, and going back and forth, and one of them just jumped off the page and just messed me up. An atheist said to a conversation with a believer, your religion is dying and you don't even know it. And it sat so wrong with me. First of all, because it's the farthest thing from the truth. The church is alive and well. The church is growing worldwide. Lives are being touched. Lives are being changed. God is still saving, healing, delivering. God is still in the business of the miraculous. It's, it's the farthest thing from the truth. But the second reason it bothered me is because that is the perception of some individuals. Amen. That Christianity is irrelevant and Christianity is unnecessary. You don't read that in the book of Acts. They, they weren't saying of the early church, your religion is dying. On the contrary, in Acts chapter 17, Jason and Thessalonica and his crew gathered together and said, get ready because those Christians who are turning the world upside down have come here also. Yeah. Amen. Oh, amen. We need a revival. Amen. Not to prove anybody wrong, but to be the hands and feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. To show them that the church is indeed a city on a hill. The church is the light of the world. The church is the salt of the earth. The church is the standard of truth. The church is a hospital for the hurting. The church is a headquarters where we receive our earth orders. The church is a gas station where I come and fill up. The church is alive. And yet we could still use... A healthy dose of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I didn't mean for that to rhyme, it just worked. We can still use a revival. We can still use an outpouring of the Spirit of God. Revival is a fresh start. Amen. We need a fresh start. Amen. Any honest Christians in the house that can say, look, I need a fresh start. Amen. Man, I wish I could just wipe the slate clean. Watch, I got some good news for you. Do you know what today is? It's not our anniversary. What you in your head? Do you know what today is? It's Shimini Aseret. Amen. I'm saying, Pastor, I would have never guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> We've been telling you this month since we came back to the sanctuary that this is a set special month in the Bible and in the Jewish people. It's the month of Tishri. We've already talked about the Feast of Trumpets and We've mentioned the Day of Atonement, and last week they started the Feast of Tabernacles according to Leviticus 23. If you're taking notes, I need you to write down Numbers 29:35, because it says, on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, actually I said that incorrectly, it says on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, eighth is Shemini. Shemini, I said it, is the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, and some of you are aware that throughout the year, in synagogues all across the world, they read, they read and teach from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And by the time they get towards the end of the year, they're at those last few pages of Deuteronomy. That means for an entire year, Sabbath after Sabbath, they, they had to readjust the scroll and, and turn the scroll just a little bit with every parasha and with every Torah reading until they get to the very end of the scroll. Watch this. But on that eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Eight is the number of new beginning. On the eighth day, when they get to the end of the scroll, Shemini Aseret means it's time to go back to the beginning. Shemini means it's time to go back to the front of the scroll. It's time to start over. I need some help up in here. Shemini means you've been through a whole lot. You've got a whole year of Torah reading under your belt. It's time to go back. It's time to roll back the Praise scroll. The I just believe that we're in this season of, of survival or revival. It's not by coincidence. I don't know about you. I'm choosing revival. I'm choosing, Lord, let's go back to the front of the scroll. God, start over with us. God, do a new work in us, God. Create a new beginning in your people. I'm preaching better than your amen. Now, there is a day coming. That will begin a new beginning. 
My Bible says, we read this Wednesday night, he's going to come through the heavens and split the sky. Amen. Watch this. There are other passages that say, when he comes through the heavens, he's going to tear the heavens and roll them up like a scroll. Oh. Because he's ushering in a new beginning. Amen. i, I got to hurry. Three. Verse 7, watch this. There's three petitions here. Restore us. Revive us. Verse 7, what's their next petition? Lord, Show us. Come on, I've heard it. What is it? Show us. Lord, show us. Lord, show us your loving kindness. Show us your mercy. God, I, I need to see your mercy. Amen. You, you see, that's, that's what happens in revival. You see, if you're dead, you can't see anything. If you're dead, you can't hear anything. So notice what happens. Because they're asking for revival in verse 6. Now in verse 7, they're realizing, okay, I can start seeing something now. Now in verse 8, they can start saying, Lord, now I can hear something now. Come on. Hallelujah. Lord, uh, you're doing something in me. You're reviving me. You're rolling back the scroll. You're starting a new work in my life. So now they're saying, God, show us mercy because now I can see it. Amen. Everybody receives God's grace, God's mercy to some degree or another, but not everybody can see it. I know you've got family members that, man, they just don't see how good God's been to them. They just don't see his grace and, and his mercy. And here's our last one. They've said, Lord, you have saved us. Then they ask him, Lord, will you save us now? I like this last one. They come to the conclusion in the last section, Lord, you will save us. Amen. Amen. If I lost you, let me do it again. Lord, you have saved us. Lord, will you save us? Lord, you will save us. Amen. Amen. I'm in verse 8. I know it's easy to amen the revival stuff and the restoration stuff. Sometimes it's hard to amen the verse 8 kind of stuff. Because he says, Lord, I will hear what you will say. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I told you. I will listen now. That, that's part of the purpose of revival. To bring us to a place where we can hear what God is saying. Yeah. When, when's the last time you, you heard clearly just God's direction for your life? And, and knew beyond the shadow of a doubt what he wanted you to do in your home. And what your next step was. You see, one of the things that accompanies a revival generation is that God raises up a Samuel. And one of the things about Samuel, Samuel had that ability to go to the presence of the Lord and say, speak, Lord, your servant is talking. Y'all yeah. going to let me get away with that? That's not what it said. He said, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Amen. No wonder over and over again in the Bible, it says, he that has an ear, let him hear. All right, now you go. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Verse 8, he says, okay, now I'm ready to listen. Man, I, I don't want to go through all of this mess in 2020 and still be deaf to what God is saying. Jesus. I want to hear him. I want to hear his voice. I want to know what we're supposed to be doing as a church. Yes. I want to know his assignment for the Padron household. Hallelujah. I want to be able to say, thus saith the Lord, because the Lord has spoken. Yes. Amen. So watch this, verse 8, clause C. He says... Don't let me turn back to my folly. You all see that? Amen. Lord, don't let me go back to my old ways. Lord, I've come too far. Yeah. You've been too good. Yeah. You've done too much in me for me to go back to where I used to be. Yeah. Ooh, I need, Amen. Amen. need some help in here today. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. He says, I'm not going back to my old folly. You see, you have to understand, not only does grace get you where you are, it's grace that keeps us here. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Jesus. Because, Lord, if you're not in this, I'll mess this whole thing up. Yeah. I'll ruin everything you've done so far. He says, Lord, don't let me go back to my old ways. Hallelujah. I need some of you to say, God, that's me right now. I, I've come too far. I can't afford to go back. Lord, you've done too much in me. I can't afford to go back. 
Amen. I can't let the dog go back to its vomit. Yeah. That's right. I can't let the backslider slide back into the pig skin. I, I can't go back to my folly. I, I've made a decision. I'm going to follow Jesus and no turning back. I'm not looking to the left or the right, but God, I'm moving forward. And I don't care if I have to lose some people along the way. I'm not going back. Here's our last one. Brother John, would you help me? I'm in Psalm 85, verse 9, and we'll pick up with the rest of it next week. In verse 9, this is the ultimate objective of revival. He says that glory will be in our land. Jesus, thank you, Come on. Lord. That glory will dwell in our land. Amen. This isn't some... National patriotism glory. He's not talking about the glory of the U.S., the, the glory of Rome. It, this is the word, kabod, that is used to describe the glory of God. Yeah. Amen. What is revival but a display of God's glory? Amen. You see, when God's glory shows up, no one accuses your religion of dying. Yeah. Amen. Amen. When God's glory shows up, Christians aren't fighting each other. Yeah. When God's glory shows up, we don't have to beg our children to come to church. Amen. When God's glory is in the house, the world wants to know what's happening in there. Who is this God? What has he done for you? Show me the God of Israel. Amen. That's what glory is. That's what revival is about. Notice he says, we need your glory to dwell in our land. That word dwell, I'm sure you've heard before in the Hebrew. It's the word shakan. It's associated with glory. Amen. We, we talk about the shakina glory of God. And for these next few weeks, I, I want us to look inwardly and say, God, I don't want to forget what you've done. But Lord, now more than ever, we need you to save us. Save our nation. Save our churches, God. Save our city. Amen. Let your glory fill this land. Boy, how about that for a COVID-19 vaccine? For God's glory to show up. Amen. Stand to your feet with me.